Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Chaluminati podcast, episode 162. As always, I'm one of your hosts, Mike Martin, and today uh, I'm here with the comedy duo uh, Buster Keaton and his oh. director. Buster his, Keaton is the his director? director? <laughs> they Buster go perfect. Ke- I don't want to be the Keaton, director. Buster Keaton, the actor, and Buster no, Keaton, the director. The director. I, two, facets, <laughs> two facets of the same man. That's what I'm like saying. That. You know what? That works. That works surprisingly well. I uh, like that very you, much. You've got me all thrown off today. No one can see it, but we're recording differently today, and I don't know why. Alex has not told us why. He won't that tell us why. He won't tell us why. Because it's supposed talking? to be a Jesse episode today, so I it have is. no idea. I don't know what you're talking about, but if you're hanging around or you're available uh, to join us on patreon.com slash Chiluminati pod later, if you want to hang if you want to hang out with us later, you should to find out the answer to this strange don't like history. It. Not a fan. <laughs> yeah, today is. Oh, that's true. Today is mini sode number 100 over on Patreon, and that's like 40 ahead of where the public is. <laughs> like I'm not right going to confirm nor deny what's going on. But if you go to Patreon.com Why would you even say it like pod, that? If you want to go to Patreon.com slash Chilmonati pod and see what this is all about. <laughs> A very special you Minnesota suck. 100, apparently. You will find out. It's going to be a normal Minnesota. I don't know what you're talking about. All right. Well, I know I, I well, that's a great shill. But before we go, I, I've had this in my head for two weeks. I needed to get it out before I forget. There's a movie I've seen that I can't think of the name of. And oh I want to know if the two of you know what I'm talking about, because I couldn't find it online. I saw it when I was a kid. So and I only re- remember something very specific. It must they have been like a child, like from these dinosaurs, right? And they, and they want to clone. <laughs> it must have been like a kid's movie in some way. So the story is about these two kids and their dad is getting married to a new woman, like new stepmom. I don't know what happened to the original mom. OK, Come to find out the mom is like an alien that like <laughs> eats people and okay. they they like have to confront her at the end of the movie in a cave. And they what? learn like high pitched music makes her turn back into her alien form. And, they, and she's like got the dad in a cocoon in the back. And they're like there to save the dad. They play like a really high pitched noise. And that's like all I can remember from the movie. This <laughs> but is I remember movie? that scene. I think so. I think it was a kid's movie, but it was like really horrific. Like that scared the shit out of me as a it's, kid. So, it sounds like the type of movie that the title is like a sentence. You know what I mean? Maybe this was in the 90s. So it was a '90s movie for sure. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know this I don't at know. all. Don't know. Like, I don't know. My man. mother, my my mother, the alien or <laughs> some shit like that. Mom is alien. Mars who needs hates moms. Violin is like the only thing I can think of. Mars <laughs> needs moms. Mars needs moms. Is oh, is it Step Monster? Ah, uh, it might be Step Monster. Right, step, so, what about my stepmother is an alien? You might be the only person to have brought this up. But I just discovered someone on r slash uh, tip of the tongue, and they said, '90s movie, girl's mom died, and then she gets an evil, evil alien stepmom that's vulnerable to violin?" Question mark. Yes, yes, that's it. <laughs> that's exactly Everyone it. Everyone says Step Monster is the name of that movie. Oh, dang, yeah. All right. I, hey guys, I've seen Step Monster. It's from 1993. Alan Thicke is in it, apparently. <laughs> That's so crazy because the movie that I found is literally called My Stepmother is an Alien. And it has Dan Aykroyd and it has Kim Basinger and John Lovitz and young baby Allison Hannigan. Like, I don't Seth think Seth Green. What the hell is this movie? <laughs> it's from 1988. No, it's Juliette the- Lewis? Harry Shearer, <laughs> all in the same movie? Whatever. No, two very definitely my mom is a step there. monster. Alan Thicke, George step Gaines, monster. Amy Dolans, Corey Feldman. Oh, it's a Corey Feldman. Alan Thicke, I can't believe my wife was a step monster. Oh, my God. Oh, I'm so <laughs> glad we got. I'm so glad I held out until we recorded the episode for that. Have you boys seen that movie? No, no, I can't. I've got I one can't on say you. that I I've have. Got, I have. I've got a little bit more film knowledge than you do now. A little you think bit more you, film knowledge you think I disagree that, with. I, did that even see a theatrical release? No, oh, I definitely saw it on TV. No way. <laughs> did no that way. movie go to like I don't know, I saw it on what TV. What did we really gain? This is like this is like if I ate a delicious nutritious breakfast with all the nutrients and you ate like a chicken nugget that was in the gutter and you were like, I have a little bit more knowledge about food than you do. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, would I be wrong though? I mean, no, but like that's <laughs> like what a what dog knows. Want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's what a dog knows. <laughs> <laughs> if 
fuck. <laughs> oh man, maybe we'll watch that. Oh man, I'm maybe in. we'll watch that on a, on a rotten popcorn. That's perfect, um, actually. I've eaten chicken nugget in a gutter of movies. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, that's next. Thick. We got to do that. Oh, we got to do that this month. Still done. Sold. We're watching that well, in probably like a few days. That's we gotta, not great we gotta start for being me. more proactive about this, Jesse. Yeah, no, I, man, gotta, I, gotta <laughs> gotta, I gotta cut this. I gotta cut this off. We gotta, we gotta, we gotta be more proactive about the movie. I let choices. him have his whims, and then we end up watching Step Monster. <laughs> yeah. uh, let me lead, boys, but not today. Today is a Jesse episode. Another, oh, another after the JFK yes. insanity. Uh, we were supposed uh, to record JFK last week, but Jesse left his homework sanity, at home. I think you mean. I think you mean JFK <laughs> sanity. Finally, I mean, there's a lot of good conversations. Yeah, I think happening you mean every four weeks we put out a mini so episode, so it was natural to put out a mini so episode last yeah, week, yeah. and I so mean, it's not my fault at all, really. <laughs> no, no, we were sub- that is that was the original plan. Every four weeks, oh, a mini so compilation. We do it like every two months. Mathis threw me under, and I will <laughs> under the bus, Ugh. Jesse. Go. All right, <sighs> okay. Ooh, if you think oh, about it, if you tire. think about it, the thing that I'm not telling us about is going to actually kind of give people two episodes this week. I don't know what you're talking about. I still don't. Yeah, know. I don't me neither. Me neither. I, I'm going to backpedal from it. Don't worry about it. You Patreon. Really should. Slash you really should. Illuminati pod. The I'm place to where do dogs an episode. I'm more excited chicken. for whatever nonsense you're doing. That's unfair. You shouldn't, <laughs> you shouldn't be. You, uh, maybe you should be. I don't know. <laughs> <sighs> I think yours I'm is probably a little bit more like it'll stand up to more Screening? academic analysis. <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably, probably. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jesse, I am excited to see where you're about to bring us before, uh, you know, you're kind of like the the happy pill of this insane downward spiral that we're always on. Well, what are you talking about? <laughs> this is the we happy view of podcasts. I'm having a great time. <laughs> Get ready, Unfinished, then. Almost fun. All right, go ahead. For something happy. And you know what? Not really happy, but something totally true. So this year, so far, Mathis has been on a true crime, true crime kick. And Alex has been telling us about one of the most famous conspiracies from around the world. So today, I wanted to take the energy of you two and <laughs> bottle it up. And then send it back out to the audience and hit okay. you with the story. Yeti.com slash Chaluminati for $30. You can buy our mojo. <laughs> <laughs> Podcaster and Mathis sauce. bathing water. Podcasting bathing mm-hmm. water coming soon. I want to hit you guys with a story that I'm not sure the audience knows about. And I'm curious if the two of you know about it. But it is right in the wheelhouse of our year so far. It's got conspiracy. It's got true crime. And more importantly, it has a great cover up. And so come back with me, if you will. I'm going to set the stage uh, for this part. This part of the beginning, it is 100 percent simplified, but that's because we just need to get through it. So if there are people <laughs> listening and they're like, Jesse, there's more to it than that. Cool. Drop your knowledge. It's, on it's like the, the kingdom Reddit. of uh, the kingdom of Mesopotamia that I learned about in high school. Right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Drop all of your knowledge to the other listeners on the Reddit and, you know, people can dig deeper from there. That's why it exists. If you must say what you have to say. All right. So I'm sure I don't need to tell anyone here that World War One was a bad time. <laughs> millions died. <laughs> more <Yeah>. importantly, <laughs> millions That's the more. Simplification? Yeah, yeah. Well, millions more were left damaged by the fighting, both physically and mentally. Shell shock, as it was coined by the soldiers at the time, left them with lifelong symptoms, including fatigue, tremors, confusion, nightmare, impaired sight and hearing. Doctors at the time didn't even know what to do with it. They were just like, we don't know how to fix this. If you want to have a bad good time, go on to YouTube and watch like really early, early like recordings of like doctors with PTSD patient patients who they just shell shock at the time and just watch them torture them. It's like, what? See what happens when we do this? Yeah. Bang! And the guy just like starts having a fit on the chair and he's like, this is interesting. It was just another symptom of the ever changing face of war. World War One had trenches and gases and mass death by machine gun. It, and like a hat with like one 
little point on the top in the middle, right True. on the top. Or like yeah. the gas mask guys with like the cool gas. Like those, some of those gas mask outfits are kind of awesome looking. Scary. Like Star Wars one considered yeah. the first like non-classical war where we move into, you know, away from horses and lines of fire of muskets. Is, it, is World War One the first one that's like kind of I mean, it is, it is in notorious that way? as being it horses, the thing obviously, that put but. an end to old warfare. Yeah. Um, okay. Just like how guns changed warfare the idea of world war one with the trenches like the reason why they had to build trenches was because machine guns would mow down thousands of soldiers in a second and so they had to be beneath surface level to not get hit by machine guns uh you know it was the last great cavalry charges and things were world war one where they were like we can do it and they'd all be murdered and it was like well all right we should never do that again yeah it, no it was that kind land. of stuff yeah and it was also, you know, it, it, it's it, it, it just off topic really quick. It is a great example of just like the way war changes and how even example from today, when you hear about guys coming home from modern wars, more and more people are surviving. But it just means that they're just more and more wounded to deal with. Right. And, and mm-hmm. more and more people to look after. And so, you know, it's kind of on us to do that. And a lot of people this is I'm going to bring it back. A lot of people felt the exact same way in the 1920s. Vets came home from war and after serving the country overseas, people thought, hey, these people are due some sort of payment for their services. And the idea of giving troops a bonus is something that's come from the days of like George Washington, when soldiers would come home from a long campaign and they would get a little something as a thank you. Little wooden tooth from the president with a signy on it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, Washington even gave people just pins. Like you would collect pins from the campaigns, and you know, just give people a little something, and then give them some money as a thank you. It was literally the least we could do, and it yeah. sort of became like a tradition. And so, the U.S. government, after World War One, came up with something called the World War Adjusted compensation act which is basically meant to like give people who fought in world war one something they deserved because you know holy shit it was world war one <laughs> yeah and it might be a good idea their payout this is i always think this is so interesting their payout was 500 bucks if you served in the states and up to 625 if you served overseas so that's something like between eight thousand and ten thousand dollars by today's standards that's, that's what you would have gotten so not- much money yeah, it's not nothing. That's for sure. That's like 10 times as much as like the covid stipends. Like that's <laughs> yeah. so much money. But they did again serve for like three years of utter hell. So, right. you know, they, but they were like we and and the thing is, is this is an adjustment act just for some clarity, because I know this is one of those things I'm skipping over and people will be like, but Jesse, during World War One, the reason that they could like fund a bunch of things and what they're going to pay soldiers is they were going to cover them. They were going to cover their insurance and they were going to cover all these different things. So they they were they were told the public we're going to offset the cost of this war and paying these soldiers by like taking care of them and all these other things for them. And then the soldiers came home and they were like, we really should give them some more money. <laughs> we boy, we screwed this that, one up. <laughs> yeah, that was a horrible fucking time. That was pretty bad. So they were like, if, we're going to give were them real some cameras money. back then. The government would have been fu- like if anybody actually saw that shit <laughs> yeah. was not like a soldier. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. It was it I was mean, just the assassination awful. of JFK on camera fucked up the whole country. Imagine if the 20s, they saw what World War One was doing on a daily basis. Right. There wouldn't have been a there wouldn't have been a world. It would have ended after the first like 800 like, thousand dudes die. They were like, no, no, we're over this. This is horrible. Thanks to Talkspace for sponsoring this episode. And if you don't know what Talkspace is, it's kind of like having a therapist in your pocket. That's why being able to reach out to my therapist or psychiatrist at any time from anywhere makes taking care of my mental health so easy. I'm more relaxed when I'm traveling knowing that if I need to talk to my therapist, I can literally just send a message from wherever I am. And working through things in therapy can be tough, but connecting with my therapist at the very least isn't. When it comes to therapy and psychiatry, getting the help you need has never been so simple. When you're able to access your provider from the comfort of your device, it means therapy can just be on your schedule. And for me, I've said it a million times and I will continue to say it, I wholeheartedly recommend Talkspace for therapy. You can sign up online and start therapy the same day as you sign up, and you can text, video, or send voice messages to your licensed therapist, so it's incredibly convenient to have virtual sessions from the comfort of your home. I've always said and always pushed for mental health and how important it is, and I still push for it. If you go to see the doctor for your body, the dentist for your teeth, because it's all so important, 
why don't you take care of your mind as well? Additionally, Talkspace is super affordable. It's a fraction of the cost of in-person therapy, and instead of waiting for an appointment, you can send those unlimited messages to your therapist 24-7, and they'll engage with you daily, five days a week. Talkspace is secure and private, using the latest end-to-end -end bank grade encryption technology to store client information and complying with the latest HIPAA regulations. And as a listener of this podcast, you'll get $100 off your first month with Talkspace. To match with a licensed therapist today, go to Talkspace.com and use our code CHILL to get $100 off your first month and show your support for our show. That's CHILL at Talkspace.com. But like all politics, there was pushback against this. Some senators were against the idea. There was like, there's no money to do this, et cetera. It's typical politics. Nothing changes. So for a while, nothing really happened and promises were made. Payouts would be coming. And they said, just chill. They're coming. Don't worry about it. And this, of course, brings us to a few years down the road when Herbert Hoover is in charge of the country at the end of the 1920s and into the early 30s. And Hoover, I mean, like he wasn't a great president and he most certainly was not given the greatest of times to be president. Um, the world goes to shit in 1929 and the Great Depression hits America. It is bad news. And Hoover takes the blame and his government completely fails to provide any relief to the people. We're talking Dust Bowl. We're talking every single grapes of wrath kind of thing you can think of. This is the time. Uh, things like um, Hoovervilles, right? The shanty towns that would pop up around the country during the Great Depression. Central Park was literally a Hooverville at one point. It was a this crazy like, housing crisis. Yeah. Employment was tanking. Yet the richest people in America were getting richer. Millions, like millionaires at the time, which would be billionaires by today's standards. Um, they were just raking in the cash. And yeah, I sounds crazy familiar. Weird. I don't it's know, man. To, That's from the twenties. We would never do something like that nowadays. Yeah, Why would we leave people suffering? poor, sick during the worst times of the year, just so a few could get richer. Weird. It's hard to believe that the government would allow something like that, considering how famous we are for paying our debts. <laughs> <laughs> so people were pissed, as I'm sure any uh, descriptions or books or any first person resources at the time. I mean, like people were mad and on I don't know the exact date. July of 1932, we'll say the bonus army marched on Washington. 43,000 strong made up of veterans and their families that have fallen on hard times who were told years ago that the government was going to give them 500 to 600 bucks, which would change their lives right now. They wanted that money. They're like, we were promised it. You said you're going to give it to us. You didn't give it to us. Now is the time to give it to us because we are in the streets. And so they marched on Washington. They set up a camp on Pennsylvania Avenue, which if you don't know, that's like right by the White House on the porch. Yeah. 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 <laughs> they literally were prepared for the long haul. They used all of their training in the army to build basically a small town. They had sanitation, commissaries. They held parades and stuff. The police that's amazing worked with them to get them food so they could stay there in the long run. Like everyone was like F the government. These guys suck. Our country's in shambles. Dude, this is imagine awful. if the cops <laughs> like helped out protesters nowadays. That'd be fucking wild. wild. Yeah. And to the government, <laughs> this was seen as an invasion of Washington, D.C. They were like, all right, we're not going to go to war with our people. This is crazy. They're veterans. We got to take care of them. But Hoover was like MacArthur. Like the Douglas MacArthur, yes, yep. that MacArthur of World War II fame. He was like, MacArthur, take the second infantry, clear the city. And so, you know, uh, I will what say an uh, insane thing that would be. Yeah. And again, this is one of those, they don't have cameras, they don't have like instant internet. Imagine you saw what it was like when Trump tried to clear protesters. And that was crazy. Imagine actual the military actually coming and removing people from D.C. That's what this was. And uh, there's a great story that I think sums up this moment where a guy who was on the side of the vets who was there during the, the with with the bonus army during this uh, invasion, air quotes, 
His name was Joe Angelo, and he was a decorated war hero. He was a man who literally saved Patton's life. Damn. And he went up oh to him because he saw him there, and he was like, my dude, stop what you're doing. Like, look at us. We are brothers. This is crazy. You're, you're, the, are you sick the army on us? And Patton just like dismissed the dude. And, wow. and that was sort of the story of what it was at the time where it, it kind of fed into the idea that both sides, the, the, the you know, both sides, there were military, but one side had clearly forgotten its loyalties to each other and now like only served the government. And it just pissed more and more people off. And so the result was, yeah, the people were removed, but the incident was the last straw for America and Hoover handedly lost the next election. Uh, so many people were pissed off that, you know, uh, although Republicans were uh, worried about Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the Democrat who was running, many people were like, screw it. He's so much better than Hoover. Don't even care. FDR wins in a landslide in 1932, just crushes Hoover. And one of these men who was a like staunch, proud Republican who um, stood with the men of the bonus army. And yet still voted for FDR was incredibly popular military figure at the time. Major General Smedley Butler. Um, he was a Smedley? Marine. Smedley. I love the name. Smedley. Major General Smedley, Smedley, Smedley Butler. He Sounds was like a fucking a, monster, dude. I can't handle it. <laughs> he was a retired <laughs> Marine and he was incredibly popular at the time in just pop culture. Um he was known, and I'll get into it. Uh, all I'll say right now is after the election of FDR, he took a hard left turn, denouncing capitalism, going around saying he was mistaken and that for 30 years he had been nothing. And this is a quote. He had been nothing but a high class muscle man for bankers and big business. This Damn. guy sounds like my kind of guy. Yeah. Right. So just remember him. He will become a key figure in this story. So let's jump back right, really quick. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just remember him. We'll come back. We'll come back. Smedley Sick. Butler. Who could forget? Honestly, it's good old Smedley. That's the real question. Who could forget new, a name a like character sh- on Rob Zombie's Monsters? Yeah. Smedley Butler. Smedley yeah. Butler. But uh, yeah, let's go back to FDR for a sec. So FDR was one of those guys who tried to be sort of man of the people. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. He, he wasn't perfect by any stretch. Oh, by but, any stretch. But he did do a lot of good. Too. Yeah. And, and he was he, the president. Yep. He what well, he was hated by business elites. Just to, just if you want to get some good reading in, go do your research on like what the people with money, what Wall Street thought of FDR. Like they were like, this dude is pure evil. They <laughs> got so worked up about him becoming president uh, that between 1932 and when it was inaugurated in 1933, it was you know how I think we all have this sensation. You know what it was like between the 2020 election and 2021 inauguration day. It was yeah. like that in the country. People were like, bro, I don't, we may not have a country by the time this guy gets elected <laughs> or, or actually put into office. It was crazy. It was a weird time to be around but the country. What was that would have been like, yeah. yeah they had so, that kind of uncertainty amongst our leadership. There, it was, it was, it was a mess. America was a mess. It was in a very bad spot. We were still in the Great Depression and we were seeing countries outside of the U.S. come back from depression eh, with a little help of something called, you know, a little bit of fascism. And yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's almost like the Nazis came out of all that. Yeah, it's crazy. And a lot of people in America were like, if a, if Germany can do it, certainly if we had a dictator of our own who calls all the shots and puts the country, you know, first and we do the things to like fix stuff for ourselves, surely we can pull ourselves out of the depression because these politicians are doing nothing for us. All they do is argue and they don't make any choices for us. Yeah. It, <clears throat> I would only say that there was a very, very large, one of the largest in the world, maybe the largest, I'm not sure, Nazi rally at Madison Square Garden so in the 30s. So, like, just put it out there. But then there was World a lot. War II happened, and we saw the true evils of fascism, and we swore <laughs> the never end. again would we let that happen, and it didn't. Never again. It didn't. That's yeah. correct. And in the 1960s, racism ended forever. I saw it in my history the book. end. A bullet in the head of MLK ended it all. And so that was me all washing of these my hands. very rich, uh, we'll say like 
capitalist elites, (laughs) they were not okay with FDR. And they kept saying, like, this man gets into office. Oh, well, mostly because FDR would say, like, I'm going to do some major social changes. Like, it's happening. And they were like, when this man gets into office, secret commie, secret socialist, this guy's going to take down the entire country. And he, I mean, he did say that he had a hundred day plan and that the first hundred days he was going to get in and stir some shit up and he was going to change the country. And that whole idea of um, the hundred day plan is kind of based we off have, of yeah. you know, when everyone you hear people in government be like, what did President X do in his first 100 days? It's all compared to FDR. Everything is comparison to like what this guy did. Dude came in, man. Dude came yeah. in swinging. And so FDR, just to give you an example, uh, he summoned the Congress back for three months at an 100 day special session where he got 15 bills passed immediately. And then he went on to pass like 76, some crazy stuff. But the bills he was passing were like the Emergency Banking Act, which helped the economy recover. The Civilian Conservation Corps, which is the whole point was like get young men fit off the streets and help them get better employment opportunities while also rebuilding the country, which was the whole idea uh, behind this whole thing is like, we're going to rebuild the country. People keep talking about, you know, the new deal, this idea that FDR had where he's like, it's a new deal with America. You see, and we're going to change the world. That kind of thing. The Tennessee Valley authority, the, the, you know, for electric power. The idea, I think a lot of this is kind of going a little weird into politics, but it's just the idea is like people see the, the, the loss of investing money into your own country, but it, in the end turns around and provides jobs which are ideally are good paying because they're being paid for by the government which then gets put back into the economy as well as making our streets not have potholes and our bridges not fall apart and put mothman out of the job but luckily thanks to william randolph hearst everyone was informed and we (laughs) used our educated brains to make smart decisions the end the end it all works it's crazy how all this keeps working out um <laughs> and so yeah he did all these different programs and you know, he, everything from railroads to farm credits to the glass steagall act which straight up separates <sighs> commercial banking from investment banking that kind of thing like the man was what trying to prevent thing for there to be a problem what an insane got rid of that. yeah yeah well, i mean he the big thing he did as part of the new deal that uh people were really hitting him for and they were like this these crazy ideas this is socialism 101 um and first off social security is fdr the social security system and then taking the dollar off the gold standard wasn't was the other thing he did and um it's because of these things that th- this is where bankers and big business types they they had it right once once he was going after, you know, the gold standard and once there was a social security system, like once all this stuff was was talked about, they they went after him hard. Uh, they called him a secret commie. They said that he was the tool of a Jewish conspiracy to take over the West. Obviously, Oops. one senator said this and I'm going to let Alex, you can read hmm. that. This despotism. This this is despotism. This is tyranny. This is the annihilation of liberty. The ordinary American is thus reduced to the status of a robot. The president has not merely signed the death warrant of capitalism, but has ordained the mutilation of the Constitution. Unless the friends of liberty, regardless of party, band themselves together to regain their lost freedoms. Again, I don't know what freedoms were lost. (laughs) I I can't figure out what was lost here. But, but this freedoms. was this was the moment that the whole country came together <laughs> and there was no more split in the government. The end. The end. <laughs> they listened to this advice. And now we get to the juice. Now we get to the real good part. That was all backstory. That was the that was the, the we got to get here because now we return to our retired general Smedley Butler. God. When I said before that he was a popular figure. I meant the dude had so many medals given to him, not just by America, but by the French as well. Teddy Roosevelt, FDR's cousin, the the previous president, Teddy Roosevelt, said Butler was the ideal American soldier. He had nicknames like the fighting hell devil and the fighting Quaker. Wow. Mm hmm. I Uh, like it. I like the I don't know if I would want to stick with the fighting Quaker. 
particularly, but the fighting <laughs> devil. Hell, hey, yeah, hell, on the that. hell devil? The fighting very good. devil? He had other names as well. He was very, very famous, and he was he was famous enough that during his life, he had books written about him. Hollywood loved him. He oh, was God. people just wanted to be all about this dude. He was basically the prototype Medal of Honor recipient. Like if you play the game Medal of Honor, you're probably playing as this dude at some point. Like he's that guy. He's very, very famous for being just like one of the best soldiers ever. But did he have a sick mustache? Um, I mean, who didn't at the time? That's what, I, that's what I'm saying. Everyone had know? like a sick stash. But uh, like I was saying, since the Great Depression and he saw kind of the truth of what his life had been. He spent years and years as a Marine helping America destroy democracies around the world in order to prop up dictators who are more American friendly so they could protect American interests and investments. And most of those investments and interests were the rich capitalists who made a fortune while his veteran allies suffered. And he that was sounds like <laughs> fake news. The America would never do that. Right, right, right. He was pissed. He was pissed about if that. If we fake say news. it's fake, it's fake. That's how it happens. Yeah. But he was a major <laughs> figure of the day, right? Like he, he, like many major figures, he didn't put a spotlight on all of his beliefs. He just believed them and was very, very popular. And so, you know, he wouldn't, you know, he'd socialize and he'd do interviews, but he wasn't like out there causing trouble. Not until the bonus army rolled in and gave DC such a hard time. The bonus army is such a good name for them too. I know. And so the bonus <laughs> army like shows you up get playing a game and they cause they cause some trouble. And now he is once again put on the the public spotlight in this in this, the you know, the stage of life. And everyone is like, man, that guy, he's destined for great things. That dude that he's going to be very important. So it'll come as no surprise to you at that point. He was sought out by all sorts. All types of people wanted to connect to this guy. And one person looking to do just that was a man named Gerald C. McGuire, a Navy vet who attempted numerous times to meet with him in 1933 and into 1934. And he just kept trying to reach out to Butler. He just wanted a moment of his time. There's a story that McGuire showed up at a hotel Butler was staying at in New Jersey, I think at the time. And he just throws $18,000 in the bed. Like, Hey, let's have a chat sometime. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> yeah. Rudy then, Giuliani. I mean, What's going on here? <laughs> well, get ready. Then Finally, Batman showed up, and tied him up <laughs> in August of 1934. The Butler would agree to meet. In, which I think is just dude held him off for a year and a half. He was like, mm, I don't know. I don't know. Finally agrees to meet in August of 1934 in the back of like an abandoned cafe in a small hotel, I think, in the back of the lobby. So they, was, no one's going to find them gonna, or see them. I was gonna be like, this is that guy who shows up to every convention desperately hoping to have your time. But I don't think at the end of that, I would get so annoyed. I'd take him to a private room in a hotel by myself. So maybe not. Maybe it's not the same anymore. Well, in this private space, McGuire recounted Butler with all of his recent trips to Europe. He was like, I was just over there. I went to see how things are going on there, how Hitler and Mussolini, I know how they're able to stay in power. They have the soldiers on their side, the soldiers at the forefront of what's going on there. And just like y'all, when you were marching, you should be the forefront of our movement. And he was like, I'm sorry, what? Thank you to HelloFresh for sponsoring this episode. And if you don't know what HelloFresh is by now, please, baby, take a seat and look me in the eye and let me tell you. With HelloFresh, you get farm fresh pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking fun, easy, and affordable. And that's why it's America's number one meal kit. Like I said, skip the grocery store and spend more time soaking up the summer sun. HelloFresh Market is one-stop shop for all your mealtime needs with quick breakfast, lunch, snacks, desserts, and even more. You, and if you're going away this summer, you can update your delivery address and enjoy HelloFresh on your vacation destination with just a click. 
plans are flexible so they work with your changing schedule. With foolproof step-by-step -step recipes means having a joyful cooking experience with a stress-free summer. Plus, HelloFresh cuts back on time spent in the kitchen with meals ready in around 30 minutes or less. You can customize your favorite dishes with Hello Custom by swapping out one protein or side for another, upgrading for a more luxe experience, or even adding protein to a veggie meal. That means more choices, more variety, and more meals truly tailored to you. HelloFresh has replaced three meals a week for me now for almost a year, which is nuts, and I don't plan on stopping anytime soon. It's made my life so much easier and has stopped me from going to the grocery store, a place that just gives me anxiety. If this sounds good to you, go to hellofresh.com slash chill16 and use code chill16 for up to 16 free meals and three free gifts. That's HelloFresh.com slash Chill16 with our promo code Chill16 for up to 16 free meals and three free gifts. Thanks again to HelloFresh for sponsoring this episode, America's number one meal kit. As he kept talking, he kept espousing all these great things that... Hitler and Mussolini were doing, but sadly that wouldn't suit America at all. He actually learned of a better way to handle America. And that would be <sighs> doing something similar to what France had done in France. There was a group called the fiery cross. Obviously it was French. I'm sure it was like Le Cross de Fiery, whatever. Hell, it was. hell yeah. <laughs> but, uh, it consisted of extremists and fascist elements and they were mostly soldiers who had tried to storm the French legislature in an attempted insurrection. 15 oh, people were killed. And in the aftermath, the prime minister was forced to resign and they got to put in a politician that was more their speed. Sounds uh, like a hmm. cool group of guys. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. A lot of like uh, mirrors to modern life. It's, it's a weird. It's weird. That this like, like, I think my anxiety is getting triggered for some bizarre yeah, reason right so now. Crazy. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> And that is when McGuire made his proposal to Butler, the military darling of America at the time, the guy everyone saw in the forefront of this bonus army, this dude that they were like, that guy's going to be important one day. McGuire said he wanted Butler to form, recruit and lead half a million veterans to march on Washington, D.C., Blending the French million. insurrection with the fascist march of Rome uh, with Mussolini's forces taking over Rome. He wanted to mix the two tactics and the veterans of the U.S. would finally have their day, finally be respected. This was for them. I mean, that is insanely diabolical and very manipulative in an in an Pawn in the game, intelligent baby. way. Yeah, like man, Pawn that's like the game. That just say, yeah, that just feels like something Littlefinger would do. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, thank God for America, because yeah. sometimes we got like some OG badasses. Every once in a while, a guy comes around like but they're like, thank God for this dude. So Butler, of course, is like, whoa, hold up, that's incredible, and veterans certainly should have their day, but. Who is who is funding this? Because surely no group of veterans who can't get 600 bucks from the government could pay for this endeavor. Who is going to provide the travel expenses? Who's going to get everyone together and train them? And where are we going to get the guns from? Why, the penguin, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and boy, you know, if only he if only he knew then a month before this meeting, like I was saying, a one month before this meeting, Roosevelt did away with the gold standard. And this idea was one that threw the monetary system out of whack and the country's like rich elites were like, if our money isn't based no. on gold, we can't get gold from people anymore. It was like that kind of like, <laughs> we can't demand gold from people. And this was the last straw for the wealthy and powerful in America. So in answer to Butler's question about who, who would be funding all of this, McGuire took Butler to meet Robert Sterling Clark, the heir of the singer sewing machine fortune. <laughs> boy, oh he boy. Yeah. Wow. He explained that he and nice some others. Nice self-made man. Yeah. Yeah, self-made man. He explained that he and some others would like to form this army with a charismatic leader to take back the nation and return to the gold standard. And if he saw fit 
at the end, they would like to have Butler become sort of the face and lead this group, but also when they take over, be their representative, the one who controls the White House, essentially. And then they would kind of like, you know, run things in the background, but he would be the face of this new government. And so <laughs> Butler was like, uh, okay, yes, tell me more. And uh, Sterling Clark said, you know, he's worth $30 million, but he told Butler, and this is a quote that uh, actually eh, you don't need uh, this. Is, you know, none of you need to read this, but actually, yes, you do. I'm going to make Mathis read this just because okay. I think it's funny and I want him to do a voice. All right. So <laughs> Clark said to Butler, I'm worth $30 million, but <clears throat> I am willing to spend half of the 30 million to save the other half. Right. So he Man. was, wow. he was so angry. He would be like, I'd waste half my fortune just to keep $15 million. I wish we could get billionaires of today, literally to do even this. Yeah, this is illegal and horrible, but they're, I don't know. They're at least spending their money on <laughs> citizens in a weird way. Well, I mean, <laughs> let's, let's keep going. You know what? I'm, let's just keep going. So it turns out it was he who paid for Maguire's trips abroad. It was he who helped Maguire learn about Hitler and Mussolini's work and how, you know, maybe the country could learn a thing or two from them. And I mean, history, Jesse, you know this. I mean, even when we were in the thick of World War Two, World War Two only lasted as long because the corporations were giving money to both sides for it, like American corporations, General Electric, etc., were also giving money to the other side as well. As we didn't join the us. war till we were attacked. Yeah, we were just funding both sides, yeah. and it's only when we got attacked that that pulled us into the war because now we couldn't. And that well, was now also got some racist shit. We were just like the Japanese oh, yeah. attacked us. We're really mad now. Fuck yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So having having this point is having corporations, uh, you know, basically kind of controlling how shit goes since the twenties. Not super surprising. Yep. And, um, well, he went on to say, that, like, I love how Mussolini treats businesses in Italy. We should emulate that here. And it, what's great is that Butler's just sitting there like, mm hmm. And tell me more. And he's like, you know what? All I'm saying is. We have me and my friends, we have already put in three million into this project. And if needed, we could do 300 million, dude, whatever you need. I have a dream that an army 500,000 strong throws Roosevelt out of office. That's what I want. That is my dream in life. And he said soon they would make an announcement about this league of businessmen that would try to tackle FDR's reckless reforms. A and justice they would slowly league, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I just had this image of like just third party comic, the league of businessmen. League and of it's bu just <laughs> meanwhile, the league of businessmen. <laughs> they, uh, they, their whole plan was something that people have been doing for years. Literally were just like, okay, we're going to make this league. We're going to put all of our money together. And while you're prepping that army, we're going to build up the tension by planting stories about FDR's ill health, his extramarital affairs, all of his secrets. We're going to just put him out there and we're going to drag this man. So he's losing power and support while you're building power and support. And then we hit him. And so that, that was their plan. Well, <laughs> I'm going to go. It didn't go well, clearly. Well, you're probably asking who would be behind this plan, Jesse. Surely we know the singer sewing machine guy was involved, but yeah. who else? Who else would be involved in this wacky plan to take over the government? <laughs> It'd be hilarious if it was actually the president himself trying to fish people out. Get ready for this. It is. It is so awful. It's almost hilarious. Oh, no. Oh, no. J.P. Morgan Jr. of the infamous banking oh. firm, J.P. Morgan, the CEO of General Motors, the CEO of yep. General Foods, the CEO yep. of Bird's Eye, like the vegetable people. Uh, I God, I don't know how to pronounce this game. Irene, Irene Dupont, the Dupont family that makes yep. Kevlar and styrofoam, that Dupont company. And then crazily enough. Their go. This is absolutely true, and it is so denied. But I don't give a damn because it was in a BBC investigation in 2007. They proved this, and I will believe this till I die. 
They're go between between the Nazi regime and these business partners was Prescott Bush, the father of George H.W. Bush. Oh, uh, th- what are you talking? Of course he was. Do we like one day when we talk, because we'll do more like Prescott. deep government stuff, MK Ultra, CIA, all that shit. H.W. Bush was in charge of some of the most heinous, horrible authoritarian decisions that were made before he was even president. The, the Bush leg, like, like the Bush family is so entrenched in some of the most evil shit. The fact that George W. Bush right now has this, um, like this, oh, he's a herky durky dumb man who cared about human humanity. And he has like this new coat of paint put on him is fucking wrong. He too was just as bad. Oh man. Yeah. Of course it was Bush. <laughs> of course it was Bush. I love, I love that. Got you. Exactly. I was like, this is going to make everyone mad. Oh, oh God. I cannot believe that that is not something anyone talks about. Wait no, until the, the Bush is talk about incredible. John F. Kennedy some more. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yes. Oh, uh-huh. yeah. It- Yes, yeah. exactly. Like, yeah, Bush is, is uh, he's man. The Bushes are in all the ne- they were involved in on like some low level in MK Ultra and all that. Like, ugh, I hate them. Continue. <laughs> so, m- you know, much like you guys, Butler, after hearing all of this, just was like, I need some time to think about this and decide this is really big. This is this could change the entire world. And so after that Fuck, after, I think I know the story now that you said that after Damn. meeting Clark, the singer guy, he goes to meet a friend, Paul French, who works at a paper in Philadelphia. And he's like, help me dig this truth. Like, I need someone else to verify that I'm not a crazy person. Will you go talk to these dudes and just like pretend you're a friend? So faking anti Roosevelt sympathies, French goes and gets a meeting with McGuire, who then like, I think this takes him to see Clark. And, yeah. and basically, they admit that, like, they're being sponsored by all these, like, basic Nazi sympathizers, that their weapons are going to come from the Remington arms manufacturers, that, um, the, in fact, French quotes McGuire, and I will have Mathis be McGuire. <coughs> uh, uh, yeah, yeah, here's the, yeah, all right, quote. We need a fascist government in this country to save the nation from the communists who want to tear it down and wreck all that we have built in America. The only men who have the patriotism to do it are the soldiers and Smedley Butler is the ideal leader. He could organize half a million men overnight. Now just replace communists with socialists. And what? It's like we're Crazy. in the present day, baby. What? We, we need, we need we a go, strong man who's going to speak his mind and put his foot down on them socialists. And then we go, did you guys just say fascist? And they go, no. No, no, not at all. And no, then we go, can you, define, what? can you define socialism for me? And they go, I don't know. Go, no. Venezuela. Yeah. <laughs> and then that's it. There's no R. Yeah, yeah. So continue, sorry. Continue. He had his witness. He, he. It was so easy. They were so upfront about it. They were like, oh, you're on our side. You know, Smedley, here's the plan. And Butler realized he wasn't mishearing. He wasn't misinterpreting. So in their next meeting, when McGuire approached Butler, this is the scene. And, um... Again, Mathis, you can be McGuire and Alex, you can be Butler. I love this. This is my favorite series of quotes, period. Great. Uh, Now, about this super organization, would you be interested in heading it? I am interested in it, but I do not know about heading it. I am very greatly interested in it because, you know, Jerry, my interest is my one hobby is maintaining a democracy, Jerry. If you get these 500,000 soldiers advocating anything smelling of fascism, I'm going to get 500,000 more and lick the hell out of you, Jerry. And we're going to have a real war right at home. We're going to have a war at home, Jerry. I love that. Uh, that his comeback to this dude is like, if you find 500,000 Nazis, I'll find 500,000 guys to kick your ass. And I'm like, my man. That's awesome. I my love man. that. Dude, <laughs> this guy, Smedley Butler, I like the cut of his jib. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he's like businessmen. He's like- these guys who thought they were smarter than everyone else made the mistake of approaching the wrong disillusioned soldier. He wasn't upset at the government. He was upset with people like them. These like rich people. Big, yeah. Yeah. He's big shot, hot shot business dudes. The men he had spent and he admits to this. The men he had spent years of his life gallivanting around the world, overthrowing governments for fighting wars for watching all of his soldiers come home and be tossed aside. Like these were the people that were the problem. 
and he was tired of it. And so he had a friend in his corner who was a witness. And so he did the only thing he thought was right. And he went to the feds. And so wow. they said that in November of 1934, they would bring his testimony and that of French before Congress. And so newspapers were pumping out things like 300, 300 million bid for fascist army bad. And uh, <laughs> of course, it was quickly poo-pooed by other papers as money starting to get involved. The New York Times wrote this for you, Alex. Details are lacking to lend verisimilitude to an otherwise bald and unconvincing narrative. The whole story sounds like a gigantic hoax. It does not merit serious discussion. Jerry. (laughs) (laughs) Banker Grayson M.P. Murphy, who was implicated in the plot and was McGuire's boss said the following and this is for this Mathis. is the shit we have to be teaching in history not this comic book version of heroic america man we need to teach kids the truth you yep. know it's a damned lie i wasn't able to stop laughing at the thought i a prominent citizen and veteran of the spanish american war would attempt such treason and then shortly before the hearings a group called the American Liberty League, very similar to that big, like, in the Legion of Businessmen, the American <laughs> Liberty League formed. Just cut to a bunch of dudes sucking each other off. The leaders of this Liberty League were captains of industry and others who opposed FDR trying to foment. And what they said is, it sounds familiar, he was trying to foment class warfare in the middle of a Great Depression and not handling the depression instead. Yep, sounds not at all like what's happening right now. And then crazily enough, weirdly enough, among its members were DuPont, Bush, McGuire's <laughs> boss Murphy, Colgate, and other prominent <laughs> figures of the time. And after it was God. discovered they were in on this plot, they were wiped out of business. Nobody ever bought their <laughs> products again. And America learned its what? lesson. Bush was put out of politics for eternity. Never again did we see any of his family bloodline in anywhere within the government. Well, we all know that didn't happen. And instead, they put a lot of their money into denouncing the hearings. And of course, all these guys who were behind this plot, none of them were called in to testify or forced to answer any questions. And spoiler, no one was punished. Except McGuire, who was seen as when I guess he was on the stand, he imploded and everyone was like, oh, he's the perfect fall guy then. Like he so quickly, easily under pressure collapses. The dude who told everything to French in like seconds, he so quickly was like, I, I mean, like Hitler, he he made roads, you know, like that he kind of shit. He seemed so cool, man. There was no <laughs> way I could have known. <laughs> and so he took all the heat publicly. But again. No one was punished for this. Just McGuire took all the heat publicly. And it's even more insulting when you realize that during this time, when this was happening in front of Congress, a, a an official from the company that was building the Hoover Dam sent a letter to Congress being like, yo, this is real. I'm aware of the fact that the American Liberty League is in league with the American Fascist Veterans Association, and they definitely are trying to overthrow the president. And I they love, just I hate the and government I love these names at the same time. Just hid that shit. They were like, mm, that's a little too much. We don't need to deal with it. It's almost like if you don't teach people about actual history, humans have a tendency toward doing very similar patterns. Crazy. Repeatedly. I know. I the, don't understand. The the thing that's crazy about this, and I know this is like we've been talking a lot about how this is like very similar to the things that a lot of people in the GOP are trying to do right now like a very tight knit group of people. But right now we're looking at this from behind the scenes. We know a lot more about this situation and like the amount of like big businesses that are like directly involved in like taking the, doing their part to manipulate the media and keep themselves out of the story. Like yeah. poor people. If you're listening to me talk about my politics and getting mad that I'm woke or whatever, and I yeah. that I have the beliefs that I have. If you're if you perceive yourself to be like less privileged than me, genuinely ask yourself like what these rich ass people are actually doing for you. Like genuinely ask you like just look into it. It's so clear. It's so clear what's happening, and but- all you have to do is just say, "Oh, maybe it is happening." Just like it already happened with. Colgate, like, like Remington, George Bush's father, like, just that, that, this is not this is a Jesse episode, okay? This is a, like 
This isn't an Alex episode. I didn't find one website that says this and use that as my only source. No, he meshed us together. Remember, he yeah, put us is, both together. We are, we like, are in the, and and I will say one of the things that um, I think is interesting, and I I didn't again, like I said, there were a lot of conspirators, but one that I wanted to save for when one of you went on this rant, which I love, is that this isn't just. I know a lot, there's going to be someone who's like, bro, you're just trying to like shit on the right again. Let me just add a name to this. Alfred P. Sloan was one of the conspirators. Alfred P. Yeah. Sloan. Anytime you listen to NPR, that dude, that the dude's foundation is funding something on NPR. So this was any rich dude. This wasn't like it's, a right left thing. This is a rich poor oh, yeah. thing. This is about this is always, that, that's money. the thing. That's the thing. It's always a fucking rich poor thing. It's never a left right thing. They just keep us. And you know that. But yeah. the, the 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 big thing too that America I think has a problem with in terms of just like its mentality is like I don't. I feel like America doesn't like a lot of citizens of America don't see themselves as poor. They just see themselves as not rich yes. yet. Mm-hmm. And and like they see these billionaires and millionaires and look up to them because they think or at least on some level think they may achieve a fraction of that one day. And you know, they want what they're going to have, but that's never going to happen as a like, 30, never, ever going to happen. It's a, just not as a, the first year that I was in YouTube and, and, and podcasting and all that shit. First year that I ended up on super beard brothers when we were pulling, you know, 3000 views a video on a good day. If we are lucky, you know, 30,000 yeah. subscribers. That's how I was thinking. You know what I mean? I was like, Oh man, one day this is going to be like so huge. I'm so lucky that I got it during like when I did with this. Now as a 35 year old man, which, (laughs) whoa, that happened quick. Like, like, uh, all I want to do is like find how to like carve out time for myself to like enjoy my remaining days and like sit with people who I love and eat delicious things and hang out and like enjoy nature and things like that. And the idea that I'm going to go from where I am now to like a rich person and it's going to be my my like turn can do attitude that got oh, me yeah. there is just totally insane. I'm not saying there's no way that you're going to get rich person listening to this, but I'm going to tell you the way to do it is not like in search of happiness because that's not going to happen. Yeah. I mean, they, they, but they purposely feed you the lie. Like, I, that, like yes. you look at you look at uh, I mean, the, the most easy example is Jeff Bezos. He started Amazon out of his, his garage, quote unquote, with his rich as fuck parents who gave him hundreds of thousands of dollars to start a business. Yeah, sure. He got that. You have that picture with his cardboard Amazon. What you don't see is the piles of money in his bank. If account. I see one more person be like Elon Musk started from nothing. I'm going to lose my damn mind. Never mind of his his emerald mine and potential racism. But never mind. Potential yeah, yeah. racism. I'm going to just <laughs> yeah. I'm going to. Yeah. Potential. You can go out there we'll and just say potential racism, yeah. straight yeah. up. Yeah, 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 exactly. Oh, man. But yeah, it's, it's frustrating, too, because like that's what they I'm in a weird way that the Internet has been good. Because if we didn't have the internet in the way we have it now, these people would have learned their lessons and they'd be able to skirt around us. But now they're dealing with the technology they once again don't understand. So we can at least get the information out there just enough mm-hmm. that, you know, it's not a total domination by an oligarchy while they still have most of the power. It could be worse without the internet. It's, I think It's personally. like those people walking around in an Elden Ring like that you run into all the time that they, they're like they're like in society clothes, but they're zombies and they just like walk around looking for shit all the time. Yeah. Yeah. They're the ones mining. They don't even know what they're doing. That's like what people are doing with the internet. They're just haunting the internet and acting like something that they're not. And just being like a dead empty person that like works for the forces of evil out of like pure complacency and unwillingness to like inconvenience themselves. It's crazy. A lot of it. Yeah. It's the crazy. inconvenience of like micro things. There's like the no. inconvenience of like taking out the trash properly. Yeah. The yes. inconvenience <laughs> of like like putting away a fucking shopping cart in the parking lot of the grocery store. Just like stuff like that piling up for everyone on the earth. It's fucking insane. You know what I mean? And yeah. and all you have to do is read. But, all you have to do is read to uh but but if you give in and in a weird way give it to a dictator, a fascist, a strongman, a leader, you now remove the need to think. And in a weird people way, like you that. give people actually people can that. have. I think that's a big part of it is they can be finally like, well, 
He makes all decisions. I no longer need to think about who to vote for this, that and the other. And that's and there also does- a privileged position because mm-hmm. the reason why I don't have to think is and he'll do thinking for me is because we think the same. Ex- and so exactly. well, I don't He's have to do anything because he'll just do it for me and we think the same. And that's just, ask, and now Ru- I can just relax. ask Russia how it turned out. You know what I mean? Just yeah. ask that when they did their grand revolution and everybody was going to get rich and then they turned into like the most fucked up place in the world for like 25 years. Like Russia is an example, a good example of unchecked, unregulated capitalism, just like run rampant. But I thought they like were after. communist. What? Yeah. No, no, no. Yeah, that's another thing. That freaking frustrates me. It's like it's not the USSR anymore, man. After that, like they turn into pure capitalism. Well, then who do we hate? Old- <laughs> yeah, I know. Is it, is it they crazy? Don't is they it, don't know. Just think about how crazy it is. Like, I know we're I know we're talking about a lot of modern day politics. So a, a lot of people are it's probably like, like that's almost like a, like a Jesse said, a mirror was being yeah. held up. <laughs> but like, just think about the fact that our strategy for fighting back against Russia invading Ukraine was to like cut off like the bank accounts of like 20 guys. And that like, yeah. and that like worked, you know what I mean? Like, just think, <laughs> yeah. just think about like the private, like we, we went to like 20 Russians and we were like, your kids can't go to college anymore. And uh, we got your boat. Nah, nah, boo, boo. And it like changed <laughs> the course of the war. Just, just yeah. think about that. Well, uh, you know, while we're thinking about rich and power and uh, all that stuff, the money and power players during the 1930s when this was going on basically used all their money to convince everyone it was a wild hoax. Um, the committee 100% found that like, yeah, there was something going on here, but they did not act on it. Um, and, you know, while it was a consensus at the time that something was 100% being planned, the gap between planning and execution they thought was so wide that there was nothing they could conceivably do. There was no do. cell phones. There was no Twitter. Like there was yeah. no accountability in that way. Like there is there was now. no text messages yeah. of like, we're going to meet tomorrow. And like, well, it was the word of these two men. Enough. You'd think that having the records would be enough. The text <laughs> yeah, records would, would be enough. Would. But sometimes uh, the date is uh, January 20th, 2022. Yeah. In case anyone looks up what that joke is about <laughs> in the future. <laughs> well, this is found in a time capsule. Uh, in two yeah, weeks, yeah. no one will know what I'm talking about. That's how fucked up That's this true. is. I know. In two <laughs> weeks, no one will remember about the Secret Service deleting the fucking texts. All but one, which is probably like, hey. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that guy will message me constantly, and I'm here for it. But <laughs> the only person, like I said, that got any heat was McGuire. And they were like, look, the dude had ideas, and he had wealthy friends with means, but no one pulled the trigger. No one acted upon it. And, you know, it's, it's because Butler was the one to, you know, immediately put the the his foot down and be like, I got to stop this. He both, in a way, stopped it from happening, but also, in a way, stopped them from having any evidence of it happening, right? So, dude is a hero, but everyone got away scot-free because they were like, well, we can't prove anything, which they could, but they didn't want to go to war with the businesses of America because at the time, the businesses of America were smearing government and being like, look at these fat cats in, in Congress. They're not doing anything to help you. But we, the American business, are Me, looking out for the you. my pillow guy. We'll help you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Butler was quoted at the time as saying, and you know what? I'll give this back to you, Alex. I think you were Butler. Back to you. Like most committees, it has slaughtered the little and allowed the big to escape. The big shots weren't even called to testify. Yep. Weird. And uh, that's pretty much where this thing called the business plot. There's many names for it, but it's 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 a plot by businessmen of America to take over the government. That's kind of where it ends. <laughs> uh, Does it though? With the bo- yeah. But for Butler, if we continue his story. He continues to become a major figure at the time. And he went on to write a book called War is a Racket. And Hell yeah. he himself, yeah. <laughs> however, after writing this book, like and and all these things, he kind of becomes a no name in today's America. He is lost to history because during this time, uh, a lot of people just kind of like were like, nah. Get them, get them out of the history books. Like, don't include this. We don't want our name. It probably, it's, pr- it's probably because his name is fucking Smedley, dude. I mean, it also could be because a Bush was involved and then we went on to have two Bush presidents. But like, you know, like, whatever. No, 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 no. Again, it wasn't until a BBC thing in 2007. Did people like, you know what? This dude's grandfather 
the current at the time, 2007 President Bush, they were like, this dude's grandfather was a freaking was like hanging out with Nazis, bro. Like, that you know, that's is, probably you know, that's probably why all the Republicans uh, voted for Obama that that year instead. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Exactly. Bingo. Got they were it. convinced and, by that and and, <laughs> and uh, voted for Obama. And that's why Obama won. And so, you know, while there are many people in conspiracy circles who know Smedley's name and uh, there's some people in the Marines who know his name, I believe there's like a Marine chant uh, for, you know, the running around uh, about Smedley. Smedley, 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 boys. <laughs> he is. You know, <laughs> that's he was. It. He's known for his Medal of Honors, uh, uh, Medals of Honor. Um, but also, dude had a darker side. Like, if you were to ask people around the world what they think of Smet, like, in America, we don't really remember him much. And in the military, they they do honor him. But around the world, they remember his ass, but they remember him for the bad things. Like, um, one of the articles I was reading about him, this person went to Haiti. And they asked, like, you know, do you know who this guy is? And they're like, oh, hell yeah. That dude was tip of the spear from when the Marines came in and, like, usurped our democratic government and <laughs> put in straight up, like, a, a dictator to run the nation on behalf of American interests. And, you know, spoilers, didn't work out so great for Haiti. <laughs> It, uh, yeah, that's kind of strange how that tends to happen as well. We're, getting, and, we're we're only just now getting to the point there. Like, I'm pretty sure that everybody with a brain in their fucking head now realizes that, like, th inside the United States, the powerful are manipulating the weak. But I think only in the last, like, three, four years even are people really comfortable with talking about the fact openly and, like, in a casual like non-controversial setting that the united states was like literally fucking the entire world up through all kinds of like weird illicit operations you know it's crazy i mean yeah. smedley says you know he spent 30 years of his life helping the rich plunder panama honduras nicaragua haiti the dominican republic mexico and more while he was in the military and he it was like, it is imperialism. What we did was imperialism. It is imperialist. That's, you know, we don't want to talk about it in America because we love to like make ourselves all hype on, on each other. But like, that's what it was. And so he spent the last 10 years of his life going around trying to prevent tyranny from happening here at home in the US that he was like, oh crap, I did that to the rest of the world. Like he finally yeah. saw what he had done. And so he proudly was out like he was out there at the time which again this is probably why he's not talked about much um because he was one of those guys in the 30s that was like we True cannot believer, yeah. fight war is awful and then we got into world war ii and then post world war ii was like america we killed yep. you all like that kind of thing and so you can understand why he'd be sort of lost to history but one of the things that's super interesting is the one person who really responded well to him the guy who really was like, holy shit, he's onto something. And the person who read the book War is a Racket was Dwight D. Eisenhower, General Dwight D. Yes. Eisenhower. And when he went on to become president post World War II, he gave a speech that yes. was based on this man. And it was about the military industrial complex. And he yeah. was saying, like, watch out for them. They're bad news. And he based that speech off of all the work this man had done, all the work Butler had done. That's where he got this stuff from. And so. I just want to leave you with like the most truly like this is a guy who had clearly reflected on his life and was honest with himself. And he just was like, look, this is this is who I was. This is what I was when I was in the military. And uh, Alex, again, this is from this is from Smedley, the, the Marine general who had one last thing to say before we wrap up. The mystery of Smedley Butler. Smedley Butler. Only the United Kingdom has beaten our record for square miles of territory acquired by military conquest. Our exploits against the American Indian, against the Filipinos, the Mexicans, and against Spain are on par with the campaigns of Genghis Khan, the Japanese in Manchuria, and the African attack of Mussolini. I helped make Mexico and especially Tampico safe for American oil interests in 1914. I helped made Haiti and Cuba a decent place for the National City Bank boys to collect revenues in. I helped in the raping of half a dozen Central American republics for the benefit of Wall Street. 
I helped purify Nicaragua for the International Banking House of Brown Brothers in 1909 to 1912. I brought light to the Dominican Republic for American sugar interests in 1916. I helped make Honduras right for American fruit companies in 1903. In China, in 1927, I helped see to it that Standard Oil went its way unmolested. During those years, I had, as the boys in the back room would say, a swell racket. I was rewarded with honors, medals, promotion. Looking back on it, I feel I might have even given Al Capone a few hints. The best he could do was operate in three city districts. We Marines operated on three continents. That is a fucking amazing quote. That is a great, like that dude looked into his soul and was like, holy shit, I feel you like i can imagine what that feels like because you join thinking one thing like you're there to help protect a nation and its people and all you're doing is like making rich men richer yeah I, operating under empire an empire we're yeah. just an empire an empire state of mind baby yep bam, and, that, bam, um, bam. <laughs> <laughs> and that is the story of the business plot and smedley butler i think that's a awesome. great ass american yeah, no, that was an awesome story. I knew bits and pieces of that, but very, very little. Like I learned a ton this episode. That was really, really well done. And again, another I feel like, Jesse, you bring those episodes that end to end up echoing today's world <laughs> a little bit. I don't want again, to that's just history. I went into this being like, all right, I know that a bunch of businessmen tried to overthrow the government. That's really interesting. And it relates kind of like it's a plot against a president, which is like what Alex was talking about. And it's conspiracy. And it's like real crime stuff that what you're talking about, Mathis. And I'm like, oh, this is perfect. Perfect. And the more I kept adding to the story, the more I'm like, <laughs> This is oh January 6th. God, yeah. This is just <laughs> history repeating. It's not like I wanted to. We got here because the shit be the same all the time. It's the same <laughs> yeah. all the damn time. Well, we're going to head off now to patreon.com slash Illuminati pod to record mini sode number 100. Alex is a surprise. I have no idea what's in store. Oh, no. no I don't know what's no, about to happen. No. He just opened up a window. We'll worry about that in a second. Why did you open a window? Uh, I don't know what's about to happen, but we're, uh, we'll do that. Hey, last thing I want to say, well, last two things. Thank you guys uh, over for selling us out of Moffman plushes again. Uh, head over to the yeti.com slash Illuminati. Keep an eye on them. We're going to try and get them restocked as soon as we can. I don't know how long we're going to have the third wave getting ready. I'm going to hope very, very soon. But while you're there, we've got all of our posters restocked. We had sold out of those recently. And in just about a week and a half, we're going to have four new products launching on the four store. New so, products. Yeah, baby. I'm gonna what leave is that as a little happening right now? What? <laughs> I, I'm just I'm doing business, baby. I'm doing business, creating some cool ass shit. I'm and some of those away. products are going to be desi are designed by Mel. Hell yeah. One of our, our, our Patreon artists. And she's fucking awesome. Is uh, it a T-shirt? Well, there's a new T-shirt coming. It won't be. We got pins coming. Is yes. We've got new st stickers. We've got stickers we got coming as well. Coming? In winter time, we'll do something like that again, like a hoodie. Nobody that needs a fucking winter. jacket on this entire earth right now, dude. I know it's, that's true. Yeah, it's but pit. what if we made like a Chilinati, <laughs> like Letterman jacket? I'm there. I'd be down. Yeah. Oh, that'd be so fucking cool. Wear it to the live like. shows. Oh yeah, the front like, has to be the eye, and the yeah, back also, has to uh, say say another thing. Chill uh, or something. I don't know. It'll also, be good. Yeah. As we get closer to Halloween. There may or may not be a yet another Halloween special live show happening out in the what? L.A. area. Just going to float that out there. We'll figure more details as that comes along. And lastly, if you've been enjoying it, guys, leave us a review. We just passed 2,500 reviews uh, and stuff. So if you're enjoying it, wherever you're listening, whatever system, uh, whatever app or whatever you're listening it on, drop us a review. Let us know what you think. It helps this podcast go a long way. And uh, yeah, we'll see you guys next week with another brand new episode. Off to do mini sode 100. I can't Bye. believe there's 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 that many. Like, what I know. What, what's yeah. happened? See you guys later. Bye. Me and my wife were sitting outside indulging on our porch one night, enjoying ourselves. I needed to go to the bathroom, so I stepped back inside, and after a few moments, I hear my wife go, holy shit, get out of here. So I quickly dash back outside, and she's looking up at the sky in awe. I look up too, and there's a perfect line of dozen lights traveling across the sky. Oh,